Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. So hello to the congregation. Uh, if you don't know where we are, uh, we are in Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. So get your Bibles ready and we'll start in just a minute. Uh, why don't we say hello to the congregation, starting with our untwisted sister, Renee. Hey, speaking of that, you guys, I finally went over to my Google thing and changed it from blunt believer to untwisted sister. So if you go to my page, I think it says Renee, the untwisted sister rolling. So it's not showing up like I want, though, you know, as the full title of my channel. So I don't know what's up with that. But I did do it and I updated some things. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I have embraced that term of endearment affectionately. Um, tonight, I, I wanted to uh, say thank you guys for praying for me. It wasn't anything serious. But I wasn't really feeling too good last week. I'm doing better, but I'm not fully 100%, so I'm taking it a little easy. But uh, MG, our brother, he's on this channel quite a bit and joins us a lot. He's really been on my heart. He needs a job. And so I, I want to ask everybody to pray for him. And also Sister Martha Ferrer. I visited with her when I took my son to Florida last year. And uh, she's got some health issues, and we want to keep her in prayer, too. Both of those people were on my heart tonight, as well as all of us on the panel. I feel it's needed uh, right now. So I'm happy to be with you guys. I'm looking forward to uh, concluding Galatians, but I hate to see it end. Amen. Thank you. All right, Brother Cripps, say hello to everybody, please. Hello, I'm excited to finish up this chapter, and uh, we're starting a new one. Probably, uh, probably have time to do that tonight, so uh, it's just a banner night to be here. I'm excited about getting a study and say hello to everyone in the chat. Hope everyone's doing well. Can't wait to get started. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brother Ben, you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to... Uh, what your all's uh, conclusion is uh, on this book. Um, I'm really interested in hearing that. And I'm also looking forward to um, completing it and moving on to Ephesians, another great epistle. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, in the, uh, the KJV, verse 5, chapter 6 is, For every man shall bear his own burden. I guess I ought to read verse 4 and 5 together since uh, they're connected, I think. is, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Sister Renee? Yeah, so we want to go um, back to the beginning of the chapter, and he's talking about carrying the burden of the other brethren if they're overtaken by a fault. And this shows us here that our attitude about sin is not that it's some freedom we're trying to get away with, but it's actually a burden. It's bondage. And we should look at it as such, and we should want to help others. Sorry, this light's driving me crazy. Get out of that bondage. And so it says, brother, a man be overtaken in a fault. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And so he's reminding people that fulfilling the law of Christ is bearing one another's burdens, helping each other with our our needs, and whether it be financial, emotional, spiritual, uh, or even physical, uh, that we should be uh, carrying each other's burdens. That's the law of Christ. And that not to think yourself above another. Um, don't forget that you too have sinful flesh and could fall in the same struggle. Um, so just have a, a healthy understanding that of that. Um, so when it says, where did you end on four? Or I'm sorry, what's the last? We went four and five. Four and five. So that's the work he's talking about. Let every man prove his own work and then shall he have re rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. And so uh, proving for every man shall bear his own burden, proving his own work. It's, it's saying uh, uh, regarding your own 
issues and uh, your own work in, in carrying the burden for another, uh, make sure that you have a healthy understanding of it and you have a spirit of meekness about you. Uh, and that we, we talked about this last week, having rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. I explained it pretty well last week. I'm not doing such a great job here. Uh, but every man shall bear his own burden. Uh, I, I think if we want to summarize this whole little section here, it's about having a sense of humility about ourselves uh, and um, to know our own frailty. And then it's uh, not rejoicing in another. How did I explain that last week, you guys? Ever improve his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Hmm. I, I remember I said it some way where I had better understanding and now I can't remember it. Let me think on that again. Well, last week you had the benefit of uh, context, uh, all the things leading up to it. That, that always makes a difference. Uh, all right, Brother Cripps, let me read. Uh, I'll read four and five in the Amplified before you comment. It says, but each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, that is, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior. And then we can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. That's it. That was the context, you guys. For verse five, for every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone is responsible. Yeah, that's that's what you were saying, Renee. You, 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 it may have sounded to you like you were uh, off a little bit, but uh, in my opinion, you weren't. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Mind your own business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Worry about yourself. Again, this is uh, we, we talk about people being sin focused and they're not focused on their own sin. They're focused on everyone else's sin. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you believe what Billy Bob did last week? He was at the do drop in and he got so drunk. And then, you know, I mean, it's just about what everyone else is doing rather than what they're doing. Um, now, this isn't particularly about sin, but it's uh, every man prove his own work. Whatever you do on your own, that you can't uh, you can't give credit to someone else for what you've done. You can rejoice in yourself. Now, this flies in the face of people saying, "Oh, we shouldn't rejoice in our own work at all." You know, uh, uh, you know, we shouldn't take any credit for anything we've done. Um, uh, so th this this seems to to be in direct opposition to that that concept. He's saying, "Well, let every man prove his own work, then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone." So, at least according to Paul, it seems like it's okay uh, for us to to do that. Uh, now, all glory to God, which uh, Paul has also made clear that he gives all the glory. He doesn't doesn't um, uh, boast in himself or his own work. He boasts only in his infirmity. Uh, but I think he's saying it's we should just stay focused on ourselves and then we can rejoice when we do something. And in, in my translation, my interpretation of it is simply that God does all the work, but we have to be his hands and feet. We have to do uh, follow through. Um, we can resist the Holy Spirit. We can resist uh, doing his will. Uh, doesn't take away from his power. It just nothing gets done. So when we uh, fall in line with what God wants to do and we, we be obedient, um, God does get all the glory, but we, ha we um, uh, cooperate. We cooperate with him, and that's, that's, what, that's what we can, we can uh, celebrate in a little bit. Then uh, verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. Yeah, I think Renee said that uh, very well. Um, uh, we're responsible for ourselves. We're not responsible. I'm not responsible for Ben and brother Luke and Renee. I'm responsible for me. Uh, uh, I, I, when I stand before God, no one's going to be next to me saying, Oh, brother, brother Cripps did. Okay. You know, I, I'm responsible for my, all the things that I do now, uh, granted, uh, by God's grace, I'll be at the beam seat and not the judgment. Uh, but I, I still will give an answer for how I spent my life and what things I uh, didn't do for God, I believe. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still be uh, given eternal body and I'll, I'll be with him forever by his grace. But I still have to give an answer for everything I do. So I need to focus on myself and not everyone else. Brother Luke, I remember what I said now. Okay, go ahead. 
I, I want to say it clear. It was in my head and I couldn't speak it. When it says rejoicing in ourselves and not another, it means we get whatever fulfillment we get in the service of God. Like it's not because we've compared ourselves to another. So we're not going, oh, uh, I feel good about this uh, because I'm comparing myself to what that guy did. It's better than him. No, we it, we're rejoicing in ourselves alone, carrying our own burden, not comparing ourselves to our brethren. So and so we glory in our we we rejoice in ourselves and not in another. So any kind of fulfillment we may have within ourselves for following this out uh, should be based on a uh, uh, glorifying God and based on our own standards within ourselves, not comparing ourselves to another brethren. We should never glory or rejoice because we're comparing ourselves to a brother and saying, well, I did better than he did, or I did it better than he would have done. It should be rejoicing in ourselves alone and not in another. So our how we feel about how we're uh, dealing with this, and this was in the context of bearing another, another one's burden, fulfilling the law of Christ, the work that we're doing there. Uh, it should be rejoicing in ourselves and and not in another. Meaning we cannot compare ourselves to other in this aspect. That's the wrong attitude about it. So sorry, I, I couldn't quite spit it out. I couldn't remember what I said last week. No reason to apologize. Uh, I know that uh, those who've been paying attention for a long time have heard us say this, but that's. I always have to keep in mind that there are always be new people and, and not only new people, uh, but uh, some people that are real beginners or novices in the word. So some things that we say and we kind of take for granted, we really need to realize that not everybody knows these, these basic things. For, for example, uh, many of the Bible translations, uh, the, the translators and the publishers uh, they to, to try to be helpful, they will actually assign a title to a chapter or even subtitles within the chapter. It's not it's very common. Uh, it might even be the case in some of the KJV uh, Bibles that are, that are being published. Uh, maybe they're even doing it there. But I can see that here in the Amplified, it does have a title for the chapter and it says bear one another's burdens. Um, and then I'm looking at the NABRE, and the title uh, initially is Life in the Community of Christ. And then when we get down to verse 11, uh, the subtitle is Conclusion, Final Appeal. So these uh, titles and subtitles are there to, uh, to give us a theme for the, 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 the uh, next few verses. Uh, and it can be helpful to keep that theme in mind. But when I look at the Amplified and it says, bear one another's burdens, and we just read a verse that said, bear your own burden, uh, it makes me wonder. Uh, I look back at, um, in the Amplified, if I look back to verse 2, it said, and we, and we discussed this last Wednesday, it says, carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ, that is, the law of Christian love. Verse three, for if anyone thinks he is something special, when in fact he is nothing uh, special except in his own eyes, he deceives himself. Now we get to verse four and five that we just read, but each one must carefully scrut. Here's the key. There's a word here in verse four, it says, but. Let me, it actually says, but also in the KJV. So uh, this word, but, you know, we, a lot of times we don't like the word, but because we can say, when you say, but it just, you just nullified everything that you said earlier. You're canceling out when you say, but, uh, but it, in this case, but it is saying that uh, what we just said uh, is, you know, you need to understand that, but there's something else you need to understand that's related to this. So it says, but even though you're supposed to help each other with each other's burdens, but each one must carefully scrutinize his own work. You must examine your own actions, attitudes, and behavior. And then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. 
um, for every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone is responsible. Um, so on one hand, it's saying to bear each other's burdens, and then it goes on to say, but you're also personally responsible. And uh, um, now if I look at the footnote in the uh, NABRE for those two verses, verse four and five, it says self-examination is the cure for self-deception. Compare what you are with what you were before and give the glory to God. Um, uh, used a load, the word load, uh, that's in the NABRE. I guess they have the word load in the verse here. Uh, verse five. Yeah, for each will bear his own load or burden. But it says the word load in this case uh, used elsewhere of a soldier's pack, correcting one's own conduct avoids burdening others with it. All right. Was that helpful at all to anybody? Yeah. I like how Chris summarized it. Worry about your own self. Yeah. I thought you summarized it good, Brother Luke. So you, so you went through it and, and just simply point out what he was saying in the beginning. And then point out in verse 4, he's saying, but, and making a separate point. But the, the two are related, like you said. They're definitely related. So he's saying, bear one another's burdens. That's the attitude we should have. But you're responsible for yourself. Carry your own load. Um, I, I think the footnote helps too. If you're where, if you're, if you're in the army and you're wearing your pack and you're capable of carrying your own load, carry your own load. If you got to get to a place where you're injured or something and someone else has to help you out, you should have that attitude as fellow soldiers, you should have that attitude. So I think both things, uh, are, are not mutually exclusive. They, they both exist in the same space. Uh, and I, and I, um, I, I like the way you characterize it. I think you, you uh, laid it out there the way Paul uh, intends it. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's go back now to the KJV for verse six. Um, Brother Cripps, you go first on this. It says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Yeah, this this is uh, my opinion. This is the 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 teacher student relationship. Let him that is taught in the world communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. So, if someone's teaching you, you should um, uh, have a relationship with that person, and and it should be uh, deeper. You should uh, uh, communicate everything. You know, like share share your heart. We say today, and it may sound uh, all a touchy feely, but share your heart with someone. Um, so if someone's teaching you in the word, uh, that's a different kind of relationship. Uh, it's like a mentor relationship. You know, you should, you should, if you're going to have someone teach you in the word, it should be someone that you trust and you should be in a safe place to be able to share everything. And that's not always the case. There are people out there. You have to be very careful who you learn from. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to learn from a lordship heretic, of course, uh, or uh, anyone else that's got a false doctrine, so you have to be very careful. But if you, if if God bless you to learn uh, the word from someone, uh, and you can have that kind of relationship where you can share things with them, I think that's what Paul's getting at here. Mm -hmm. All right, Sister Renee, verse six. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to see if I could take the leap here about supporting teachers. So. Oh, let me get my thing off. All right. So let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. It sounds like he's saying to um, those that are uh, mature and understand the word of God, support the teacher. Uh, it, it does seem that way, that taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So uh, I think this could include uh, any kind. I think it could include the burden of financial support, emotional support, spiritual support, um, study support, because he's saying here that somebody that's taught in the word needs to communicate unto him that teaches in all good things to to actually um, work with and support the teachers of the word. It's what it seems like it's saying, um, as well as just a general statement if somebody is mature in the word 
that we should support the brethren through what the word of God says. If you have understanding of the word that we should uh, help support those. Cause you know, the whole thing here is about helping those that are maybe weaker in the faith or newer in the faith or babies in the faith or struggling in the faith, because it starts out with someone being overtaken in a fall. And then there's the warning not to be puffed up, uh, to bear your own burden, uh, not to compare yourself to others. Um, uh, because you too can be tempted. Don't thank yourself to be something because you're not. And so we get to hear about bearing his own burden, fulfilling the law of Christ, which is love. And we're going on to now teaching uh, how that's supporting the brethren as well. So let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So it does sound like it's talking about supporting the teachers of the word is what it sounds like. And also if you are mature in the word to be able to convey that to those that are also learning, because that's part of the burden. Okay. Thank you. You know, uh, when you were making that point, I did not see that in the verse um, at all. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you that, uh, these other translations are in agreement with your point there. Let me show you in the, um, in the Amplified. It says, uh, for every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he is alone is responsible. Oh, I'm sorry, that was verse 5. Verse 6, the one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his spiritual and material support. Uh, so uh, when I read the KJV, it says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth, now here's the key, in all good things. So the phrase in all good things, uh, this is how uh, Renee and, and the other uh, the Amplified, and I think it's correct that your conclusion that in all good things means what the Amplified is saying here, that uh, that even includes in contributing to his spiritual and material support. And if we look at the footnote in the NABRE, he says, uh, implies oral instruction in the faith by catechists. These are to be remunerated for their service remunerated that means financially compensated so um they're in agreement with you sister renee uh that the uh, phrase apparently the portion of that verse uh, in all good things uh they are interpreting that the way you are that that includes supporting the teacher in all good things always in including financial support yeah the one thing is the way it was worded was kind of weird you know uh, cause at first glance, it looks like it's saying, you know, to teach them yourselves. But then when you see the word for those who teach unto him that teacheth. So yeah, that makes sense. I'm glad. All right. Um, anything more, uh, scripture Renee, before we move to the next verse? All right. I'll go to verse seven then verse seven. In the KJV is, um, uh, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Hey, um, is it Brother Cripps your turn first or is it Renee's? No, I went first. It's Renee. Yeah, Renee, verse seven. Cripps and I both love this verse because uh, here's people's answer to those that want to accuse us of loving sin. God's not much, reap what you sow. Lost or saved, ooh, ooh, ooh. comes back, <laughs> come back. That's what people can't get. It's, eternal life is a free gift. That is a done deal, salvation's finished. Mm. But that does not mean that you don't suffer consequences mm. for wickedness on this earth. Uh, so, this is clear to me. There is a law in this world of sowing and reaping. And I believe, well, the 
the word of faith people have really taken this too far. But I believe this is a law uh, that whatsoever man is so he uh, so shall he reap. So if you're sowing into others, and that is the context here, sowing into others, helping them overcome these sinful things that might be holding them back from maturity, uh, teaching them, supporting teachers, supporting uh, the church with whatever you have, whether it's financial or time or prayer or whatever. When you're sowing in, you reap that. And so whatever your focus is on, that you're going to get back. So I think this is just a reminder of that law. What what uh, God is not mocked. And that's you reap what you sow. Um, and sadly, most people can't get this. Yeah, we are secure in Christ because why? Eternal life's a free gift. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He rescued anyone that simply trusts him for it. But it is his will that his children not get his name uh, blasphemed by doing wicked things. And if you are a child of God and you sow wickedness, you better believe you're going to reap it back. So um, this here is not so much a uh, uh, to scare them, but to encourage them and remind them, hey, sowing into the brethren, sowing into teachers, sowing into the body of Christ, you will reap it right here. You'll reap it here and in eternity. I think it's more of an encouragement. There's a bit of a warning, but it's more of an encouragement because this whole thing here is to encourage us to fulfill the law of Christ, which is love, to bear the burdens of one another. Amen. All right. Um, Amen. I guess I'll read that in the uh, Amplified. I don't know what else it could say. It's not uh, going to do better than Renee did. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 7 in the Amplified is, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He will not allow himself to be ridiculed, nor treated with contempt, nor allow his precepts to be scornfully set aside. For whatever a man sows, this and this and this only is what he will reap. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can add to this. Renee did a really good job of saying this. this it, she's absolutely right. This is what we get accused of in the grace community of uh, uh, saying uh, that we have a license to sin because, you know, we're, we have liberty in Christ, so we can just go do whatever we want. There's not any consequence of this. Uh, as she said, this verse absolutely refutes that. Regardless of whether you're saved or not saved, this this is a uh, law of sorts. This, I, I found this to be true. I don't know about anybody else, but I have seen in my own life reaping and sowing. I've seen it. Now, uh, it is true that there are some things that God has said, oh, okay, you know, you did that wrong, you didn't get caught for it. Uh, and, and I'm not going to make you pay... Uh, uh, the consequences of that in the way that you think you are, but there's always consequences. If you if you're a believer, there's chastisement. It may not come in the same way that you think it will, but there, but but it comes. Uh, but this, I let like I would like to hear someone argue this point uh, against this point because I have found it to be true. Um, you, you reap what you sow. I mean, people say it, and it's kind of a glib saying. It's, oh, well, you reap what you sow. Well, it's actually it's actually very true. You sow, you, well, I'm not going to uh, jump ahead, but he goes on to explain this in the next verse. Uh, I'll get to comment on that. But as far as verse 7 is concerned, um, Paul is is saying, you know, you, you're, you're, if, if you uh, if you reap something or if you sow something, you're going to reap it. And... Um, uh, I'm sorry. So he's gonna he's gonna fill it out a little bit more in the next verse. I'll just stop there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, this one verse and in, in this this whole concept that we're discussing now, it could easily be a a, a one or hour discussion. I think. Um, but in the little time I can take for this. Uh, I'm, you know how much I'm against Calvinism. Uh, I'm totally against the, what Calvinists call the sovereignty of God. Now, I do believe that God is sovereign, but the way Calvinists define sovereignty, I would call hyper-sovereignty. 
and that is their their belief is that uh, God actually controls uh, the movement of every dust particle, every molecule, every thought, every word, every deed that we do. We're it, God's determining it. It's called determinism, and uh, it's um, it's an extreme uh, viewpoint of so God's sovereignty. The truth is that God is sovereign. Uh, by the way, the word sovereign is not in the KJV Bible anywhere, but the concept of sovereignty is, uh, in the biblical concept, I believe is much like we would look at an earthly kingdom. If you have a kingdom and you have a king, that king is called a sovereign. And that's an interchangeable word for king. And as sovereign, he has the right and power to do whatever he wants in that kingdom. And uh, he doesn't even have to explain. He just, it's his right and any authority to do it. However, he's not controlling every action, every, every movement and of, of all of his um, uh, people in the kingdom. Uh, but anytime he wants to intervene, intervene into the, uh, his uh, kingdom and impose his will, he can. So that that kind of sovereignty is is biblical. Mm -hmm. but the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, um, I, I've always thought, and I use the term uh, reaping and sowing. I called it the law of reaping and sowing. And a law is something that is absolute. It, is, it never fails if it's a law. Uh, but as I was studying the book of Job, it made me rethink it because uh, I don't believe Job reaped what he sowed in there. Uh, he, he didn't deserve all the bad things that happened to him from, from the devil. Um, uh, he's called the, most, the, the greatest man in the world. I mean, God said, here's the best of, all, of everybody. Uh, go ahead and test him. So it did serve a purpose, but it wasn't a result. And that's the charges against him from his so-called friends. Well, you must have done something wrong. Can't you admit what you've done wrong and confess it and cry out to the Lord for forgiveness? And But Job says, I didn't do anything wrong. It's, uh, it, and it's, the truth is, he didn't. He was just being used to a, a, as an object lesson for all of us. To learn to learn from this book of Job, and we can all think of people in our lives. Maybe you personally have you ever had something bad happen to you that you didn't didn't do anything to cause it? Uh, so there are uh, there's a saying that bad things happen to good people. Now we know that good people is in, in the Bible is there's no one good, but if we if we use good in the secular sense, in, in that and the, some people are relatively good compared to others. So you look at people and you think, uh, this person, gee, they didn't do anything to, to cause, uh, that's, they're an innocent victim in this case. They were robbed or mugged or raped. They were hit T-boned in a car and killed, and they didn't do anything wrong to, to deserve it. So sometimes bad things happen to good people. And we also can notice that there's a lot of times people prosper that we think are completely evil and horrible, and yet they, they prosper. So I don't think that the... A reaping and sowing is a law. I think it's it's a principle that's generally true. Uh, and it, most of the time, you're going to reap what you sow. But it's not an absolute. Uh, but in this case, and this is talking about the God and mocking God. So if God's involved, if it's, a, if it's an issue between you and God, then God's not going to be mocked and ridiculed, and he will, he will impose his, his will because he is sovereign in that respect. I think I covered the points I wanted to. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. I like how you explain God's sovereignty there. A lot of atheists blame God for the suffering of the world, et cetera, et cetera, uh, although he doesn't cause them. And I do think the sowing and reaping here is uh, uh, in reference of an overall principle, like you said, uh, as well as to the saints. Because when you're his child, you have, you are his, you're his kid now. And so uh, he has uh, the, uh, the right to intervene. You cannot just blaspheme his name and nothing occur. If like Ananias and Sapphira, they reaped what they sowed. Um, and I think it's a general principle, like you said. Uh, and ultimately, it is frustrating. We see verses in Proverbs about the wicked prospering and how long is God going to allow that? But we see that they reap destruction ultimately. Uh, 
Um, so I agree with you. I think it is an overall uh, principle that's discussing here, but especially when it comes to God's children, if you are, are sowing in one way, you can guarantee if you're his child, you're going to reap it somehow. And um, Hendrix wanted to ask, asked us to explain to the, everyone what sowing is. Sowing is an agricultural term. It's where you uh, plant seeds, basically, as you tear up the ground, you plant the seeds and you are sowing uh, for a harvest to be reaped later. So you're planting the seeds and then you water it and you take care of it. And then later on you reap whatever those seeds produce. And so this is used as a spiritual term in the scriptures of sowing and reaping. So whatever you're nurturing, whatever you're planting and, and focusing on and, and watering, it, you're going to reap from that same thing. And as a principle, I think that's true. And in this context, it's what you're sowing into God's kingdom. And it's a promise that God says you will reap what you put into his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Cripps, do you have issue with anything I said? I don't know. No, I don't have any issue, but I do agree that this could be something we, uh, we could uh, talk about for hours, hours and hours. Uh, I liked what you said. I would, I would, would argue that, uh, if it is a law, and I'm not saying it is, but let's say it is a law, it doesn't mean that God can't decide that Job, for instance, although he didn't reap bad things or, or sow bad things, isn't going to reap something for his glory, for his purpose, which I believe everything was for the glory of God, including what happened to Job. So uh, I, 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 though, so if it is a law, it doesn't mean that, that God necessarily has to, like he's bound by that. Um, that's the only thing I want to say, but yeah, it's a very interesting, uh, topic. Uh, and it's a verse that is the uh, commonly quoted and I think commonly misinterpreted and, and, and used in the wrong ways. Uh, but I like what you said. That was good. All right. Thank you. We'll move on then. Uh, the next verse, uh, in the KJV, uh, verse, uh, uh, eight, eight. is it? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Well, here it is. So here's the promised uh, uh, more ex exposition from verse 7. So verse 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth that he shall also reap. And then he follows up with this, for he that soweth to the flesh. So if we're sowing to the flesh, in other words, uh, we're deciding to walk in our flesh instead of the spirit. Now, as a believer, we have uh, the the quickened spirit in us, and God wants us to walk in that spirit rather than walk in the flesh. And uh, Paul uh, goes to great lengths in all his epistles to to uh, bear this point out that we should walk in the spirit. We should walk in good works that uh, that God has set aside for us before the foundation of the earth. We should do good things. We should. Uh, give to our brothers and sisters. We should support ministry. There's all these things that we should do, uh, but we have free will. So we can decide, even as a believer, uh, a lot of people don't agree with this, but even as a believer, we can walk in our flesh. And so it's difficult to look at someone that claims to be a believer and they're walking, they're living in disobedience. From our perspective, it's difficult to see. Are they a believer? Or are they not? Um, so that gets into another whole whole thing. But uh, Paul, I believe Paul is explaining it here a little bit more from the verse above, He's saying uh, if we reap in the flesh, we'll sow in the same. If we reap in the spirit, in other words, we do, we operate in the fruits that God gives us. Uh, uh, we, we talked about that last week, all the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, etc. He gives us those fruits. We operate in them. We spread it around. We are salt and light. That's reaping in the spirit, walking in the spirit, and then we'll uh, so we'll sow good things because, or, or sorry, reap everlasting life as a, as a byproduct of that. I keep interchanging the words. I didn't mean to. So it's reap. You're, you're sowing and reaping. All right. Thanks. Sister Renee. Yeah. You know, I agree with that general principle. It, even as a saved person, if you sow to the flesh and, and, and not, hear the spirit you sow into all the desires of the flesh it reaps corruption you can even die early but yeah. here i think the context is is circumcision and those that try to be saved through the law and works of their flesh 
I really do. If we go uh, further down, I don't want to go ahead, but I just want to give you an idea why I think this. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. So when he says, he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Uh, I believe what Jason said is absolutely true in the context of us being saved and reaping, you know, sowing into the flesh. He's absolutely right. Uh, but I've seen people use this verse to try to say, see, if you don't uh, walk in the spirit, uh, you're, he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. See, it is partly your works. You see, because it can seem that way if you look at it at first. He said, if you sow to your flesh, you reap corrupt, but he that sow it to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. See, it almost seems you can take it out of context there and make it seem like uh, it, your salvation is based on what you're sowing. And I that's didn't. not true. Huh? I, I, you, you're not saying I said that. No, I no, no. I could, people twist this you yeah, yeah. correctly that this is uh, in the context of saved people that it just means destruction physically. Uh, but that I've seen people twist this verse to make it seem conditional upon that you only reap life everlasting if you're sowing to the spirit, not the flesh. You see what I'm saying? That's why I believe this verse is talking about those that are obsessed with the flesh, like works of the flesh, like circumcision, because he was talking about it before this chapter. And then just a couple verses down, he goes, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised. So I think what he's saying here, if you want to, uh, those that uh, reap to the flesh, he's talking about trying to earn it through works of the flesh shall reap des uh, destruction. But those uh, that sow it to the spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit that saved people, shall the spirit reap life everlasting. So I think it's an encouragement to continue in doing good because we will re be rewarded for it, but also because we have the promise of eternal life. You know, that this is our, pr because we have the promise of eternal life. I just don't want anybody taking this and twisting it and saying, see, if you sow to the flesh, you'll lose your salvation or you won't reap eternal life. And that's not what it's saying. Both, both uh, applications are correct. The one that Jason gave is correct. Uh, for a saved person, reaping to the needs of the flesh, desires of the flesh, you reap physical destruction, death. Uh, but if you reap to the spirit, uh, everlasting life. But we already have the gift of eternal life. So you have to uh, be careful not to let someone trip you up on that. But I believe the context here of reaping to the flesh is in context of circumcision and those trying to sow into the flesh for salvation brings them uh, destruction. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I, I see circumcision mentioned, uh, so much in this chapter. Does that make sense? I think. Yeah, very good. I'm, I'm very happy uh, that you, uh, regressed, went back and, and connected the dots uh, because, uh, there is an obvious problem with this verse. Uh, we see Hendricks and also Richard Whitmire, both asked the question about this verse uh, and that uh, uh, many people would ask. And this was it, does this mean that we, uh, our everlasting life is, is connected to this, uh, sowing and reaping? It, and um, obviously, uh, I think you're right, Renee, the way that you uh, went back and talked about the thoughts that led up to this and, and that uh, this is talking about uh, either. Uh, the law, starting with circumcision, and then and when you take circumcision, then you're putting yourself under the law, and then you're under a curse, and you've got uh, uh, you've got to be perfect, so that won't work. Um, versus the the gospel that Paul preached to them, then uh, that's that's faith, and that's that's the spirit. So I think that these terms here, the way you uh, expressed it, Renee. Um, uh, how is it expressed here? Uh, sowing to the flesh, that would be like the law, uh, legalism, and uh, sow it to the spirit would be the gospel message. I think if you're going to go back to the context of everything leading up to this. However, 
for a person to understand that if you take this verse out of context a person will never understand those that uh, uh hey there's a lot of things that led up to this verse that we need to incorporate in our conclusion uh that's why I, i'll repeat it again and because uh, apart from just context generally that the most important principle in bible study and in forming your doctrine is the uh, clarity uh, and frequency of a verse, of a point. Um, this verse here obviously could be very, very confusing and could be misconstrued if you don't go to the whole context of how this fits into the whole book of Galatians and also into the whole book of uh, the, the, the Bible and salvation by grace. So if you don't keep it in that whole context, you could come to a, a horribly wrong conclusion from this verse. That's why you're, if you want to have a doctrine, why not use the verses that are explicit, uh, that, that clearly say that we're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, but apart from any works, we could give you a hundred verses like that. Um, Brother Jason Cripps, I uh, know Jason Jack and I, we did a series called 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone, and we could have done 200 or 300 verses, but uh, uh, there's plenty of verses that clearly state we're saved by faith without any works. And if it's clear and it's so explicit that it can't, it's not confusing in any way, and then that same point is repeated hundreds of times, that's the doctrine you have to, and that's your conclusion that uh, you can have confidence in. So uh, don't you and uh, use uh, verses out of context and don't allow others to pull them out of context uh, to support these, these heresies of uh, faith plus works for salvation. Yeah, and I want to mention this sowing and reaping thing. I, I'm so glad, Brother Luke, you, I may have, when I said law, I could have made that an absolute. And I want to be clear that I don't believe it's an absolute. I've seen terrible things happen to good people, and I've seen wicked people prosper horribly. I'm talking about uh, the context here of when you're dealing with God. I think Jason pointed that out very clearly when God's involved. It's whatever resources you're sowing into God's kingdom in any way that it will be multiplied to you. I believe that God is, is telling us here as his children, it's a worthy thing to sow in, to sow into that spiritual kingdom because we will reap. There's no doubt we will reap. And I think that's what it's saying. If you sow to the flesh and uh, if you sow to the spirit, you reap everlasting life. It's an encouragement to please sow whatever your resources are, not just financial, but teaching and support and et cetera, uh, and bearing one another's burdens. Sow into the kingdom because we will reap it in this in everlasting life. I think it's just an encouragement that when you're dealing with God, that it's worthy to sow into his kingdom because he will make sure that you reap uh, the benefit of it. Well, Renee, I uh um, I, I'm going to ask you to respond to something because uh, I, I don't know where Michael McGregor is getting this from because I think this is a misrepresentation. I, I've, I don't think you've ever said this or taught what he's saying here, but he just posted, I disagree, Renee Rowland. If you say we can't go on sinning, we're, sa we're saved by the law then. We, no, can, no. we we can sin, but it's okay. Well, but uh, when, you, when you said we can't go on sinning, yeah. sister, let me tell let me tell you why I answered like I did. Michael McGregor asked us, we do have a license to sin then because we have eternal security, and I said no, because God forbids it. So if we had a license, as in here, go ahead and do all the wickedness you want without consequence. Because God said it's okay, you're eternally secure, then that's not true. Because God's not mocked, you reap what you sow. And so if you're his child and you want to reap to your flesh, you will you I mean, you want to sow to your flesh, you will reap destruction. So in the sense that you have a license to sin because you're secure, uh yeah, I've never had a Christian actually try to see how much sin they can keep getting away with just because they're secure, but yeah. I guess technically you could say that, but to say we have a license to sin because we're secure, no, because God forbids it. Shall we sin so great a amount? God forbid. How can we, being dead to sin, live anymore therein? 
So of course we still are in the flesh and we still have apathy and laziness and we all fail every day. But that doesn't mean we sin more just because we're saved. It's defeating the purpose of uh, God's purpose for his children. And so to say license to sin, that's actually incorrect in that. And I know where you're getting it from because Jack Smack says that. But here's the thing. If we had a license for it, God would not forbid it. He forbid it. He forbid his children to continue in sin so grace may abound. He said, no, don't do that because you will suffer consequences. And just because you are eternally secure, remember your works are rewarded or you will suffer loss of reward. Why would you want to be least in the kingdom? So uh, works matter. They just don't save. And to say it's a license to sin is really silly. And it's a carnal argument because no, God forbids it. Now, I, I'm not preaching sinless perfection. I'm just saying, no, we don't have a okay from God to go on sinning because we are not that person anymore. That's not who I am. And I'm trying to grow more in the likeness of Christ because of who he says I am in him. And so that should be your understanding. So when you say license to sin, that's different from saying it won't condemn us eternally. Yes, if you're saved and you go on and want to stay into this habit you got, you won't, won't let go of. Yes, you'll still be saved. But that doesn't mean it's a license to sin. You're still in jail. You're still in bondage that you're keeping yourself in. And God forbids it. So, no, it's not a license. It's not freely without consequence. All right. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Church for the Truth, uh, Kevin, hi. He says, um, I'm so confused. Is Mike actually going after Renee on a license to sin? Uh, that's what I'm saying, Kevin. I'm wondering, Mike, what is going on here? Uh, uh, you, you seem to be um, um, putting words in Renee's mouth that she doesn't say. Uh, I, I don't ever hear, hear her uh, saying that uh, uh, the, the points that you're making, when the way you're, you're saying you disagree with Renee on this point, when she's not making the point that you're claiming. So if you're going to uh, disagree and, and say that someone's wrong about something, uh, uh, make sure that you're not putting words in their mouth because the point you're making is, is not uh, what, yeah. what she's actually said. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if you know it's not listening very well or what, but you're wrong. Yeah, he's saying that technically because we are secure, uh, it is a license to sin if you want to get technical because it means sin won't condemn you eternally anymore. But I don't like those wordings because if God forbids something, it's certainly not a license to do it. Just because he won't send you to hell and your sin debt's paid doesn't mean it's without consequence. So there is no license to sin. You're his child now and you'll get your butt spanked if you keep on that path. That's why you see Ananias and Sapphire dropping dead. So we shouldn't, our attitude should never be how uh, we should sin just because we're eternally secure. That's not our attitude. So the words license to sin is what I'm having an issue with. Because he says, if we don't have a license to sin, then we're saved by the law. No, we're not. Just because something won't send us to hell doesn't mean we have a license to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anybody here has a right to disagree uh, and, and even publicly say, I think you're wrong about this and this is what I think, but make sure you're not misrepresenting what others are saying because that's what I'm getting, Mike, from your, your comments is that you're actually misrepresenting uh, Renee's point of view and that's not being fair. Well, our attitude should be like Joseph. When the woman wanted to have a, an adulterous affair with Joseph and he was the head of the household, he said, how can I do this wicked thing to my Lord? He saw sin as doing it against God. 
And that should be our attitude. How can I do this to my music? Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next verse. Uh, the uh, verse nine, the KJV says, and let us not be weary in well doing for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Whose turn is it? It's Renee's. Okay. Okay. Yeah, again, the sowing and reaping here, as Jason pointed out, is specifically within the realm of God. Uh, that this is a good principle. When you're sowing into spiritual things, you will reap them for certain. This is something that we have, and so we should continue to do it. Uh, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, it is rewarded. And the reaping here is we're not going to reap everlasting life because we do well. Okay. I, I've seen people twist this, uh, Crips. I know you have. Uh, see, so it's in the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. And you will, if you faint not, if you keep doing well, you'll reap. No, it's it, there, there are rewards for it uh, temporally and in eternity. So it's more of a exhortation to them to don't get tired of doing the right thing because you will reap. So don't get tired. Amen. Always do the right thing. That's Amen. all I'm saying. Yep. Okay. Let's uh, let me read that in the uh, amplified brother Cripps. Uh, verse nine in the amplified. Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give in. Yeah, Renee is absolutely right. She did a great job, as usual, of explaining this. Uh, this is an important verse. This is a verse that my mom used to quote to me when, when I was growing up, and um, uh, I, I would say that I didn't fully understand it, but as I grew and, and started studying the, the word on my own, it made more sense. But this is absolutely one of those verses that uh, people used to say that we're not saved, we're being saved, and we have to persevere to the end. Uh, you know, our salvation is not assured and, and, until we uh, get to the end and, and we stay in the faith. You know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't depart from it at all and all that. Um, I, I couldn't disagree with that more. I mean, if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you, you're not, you're, your faith is secured. Your belief, uh, if you fully believe, then uh, you're, you're secured. It's not based on uh, whether you persevere to the end or uh, faint or not faint or whatever. He remains faithful. So that's, that's pretty clear. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is definitely... Um, uh, uh, continuing in, in your good works, continuing and, and, and don't get weary and well doing. I think it, I think it is exactly what it says. Don't be weary and well doing for in due time, uh, you shall reap a great reward if you faint not. Um, I, I, I don't think it needs to be like, uh, uh, looked at the sentence structure to make sure uh, it means, means something else. I think it's very, very clear with what it means, especially in the context of the rest of the, what, what's being explained here. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just move on to the next verse. I don't really have any more to add to that. And it, unless you or Renee want to say more. No, sir. Okay. 10, right. 10 the to... one coming up is a good one. Yeah. Verse 10 in the KJV is, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Yeah, so this follows up verse nine. So if you want to know what verse nine is talking about, or you know, read everything in the context of the whole chapter, and these are connected. So if people think they're talking about salvation here, the persevering in your salvation, then they would have a problem with verse 10. Uh, he's saying, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good. So what's what's doing good about? Uh, well, it, it says, be not weary in well-doing. So doing good is similar to well-doing. Um, 
they're they're the same thing. Uh, while we have therefore opportunity, let's do good unto all men, especially unto them who are in the household of faith. Um, as he's pointed out in other verses, how we're supposed to treat other uh, brothers and sisters in the faith. So he's saying that this is important, especially in the body of Christ, to treat, uh, to do good unto uh, everyone in the same house, the household of faith, um, other believers. I think that that one's pretty clear, too. That's all I have to say about that one. Okay, thanks. All right, Sister Renee, what do you say? All righty. Yes, we have therefore opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So again, our brethren are come first. Um, you'll see in the first century churches, they cared for the poor uh, and the widows and the orphans that had no family. He called them widows indeed, didn't he? Something like widows indeed, because they have no actual family at all to help them. Those are the ones the church made sure was cared for uh, first financially. So it's especially of those of the household of faith. Um, but even the, the unbelievers, we should be uh, giving them grace and kindness so that they can see Christ in us and also be saved. But as far as resources go, your time and your effort and your finances need to be dedicated toward those of the household of faith first. Um, that's what my pastor stands by. We had one lady that kept calling and wanting groceries. Well, he brought her groceries and then she calls one morning and goes, can you bring me some breakfast? He's like, so he brings her breakfast, but said, you need to come to my church. This is these tiny resources. We only have like 40 people are for the church members. And she wasn't even willing to come to the church. She cussed him out. And apparently she had called a bunch of churches trying to get free stuff and then would call them bad Christians if they didn't do it. And so um, he told them this print her this principle. We are supposed to take care of our people first and be kind to those on the outside. But if you're not willing to even come visit the church or be part of the church, I can't continue to go into you. So he stuck by the principle that we should be do good for all people, especially those of the household of faith. We need to take care of our brethren, their needs first. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, forgot. Uh, Cripps, did you talk about 10? Yes, sir. I went first. Okay. So, uh, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Um, we are told here and uh, elsewhere, there's, I recall a verse that says that we should prefer the company of um, believers uh, rather than being having uh, company with uh, the non-believers. Um, I do prefer the company of many believers, not all. There are certain believers, of course, that, I don't want their company uh, and they probably don't want mine. Uh, we, we, Paul says, if possible, be at peace with all men. Well, I, I, what I read out of that verse is that when he says, if possible, that means that it's not going to always be possible. You're going to find some people, even though you share the faith, that it's not possible to be at peace or let's say you're not compatible. You don't want to be around each other. Um, you probably have met people like that. Maybe some people think you're like that. I know some people think I am like that. So we're probably all had some experiences like these, uh, I'm citing, but uh, uh, generally, I like this congregation here. It's a joy to be uh, with everybody here because not only do we agree on these, uh, our faith, uh, but we are being kind and gentle as we disagree and discuss uh, the, the Bible. So it makes it an enjoyable experience, and I want to be around you. But unfortunately, there's a lot of believers, though, that that uh, they have a lot of dogmas, and they're intolerant uh, if you disagree, and they can get really quite ugly and get in the flesh. And so uh, as, when it says... Uh, uh, of them who are in the household of faith, especially into them, 
Uh, yeah, generally it's true. I, I'd rather be around people who share the, our faith, but but not always. Just because someone uh, you know uh, believes the gospel and they're going to be ha have eternity in heaven, <laughs> doesn't mean that uh, they're they're somebody that you you like to spend uh, time with. Unfortunately, but uh, basically uh, overall, I'd say that I, I do find from my own experience that it's generally true. I don't know if I confused myself. Anybody know what I mean? All right. Anything else or should we go on? Okay. No, no, it's fine. No, it's not what? It's fine. Okay. All right. Now, verse 11, I notice in the um, NABRE, it has before verse 11, it says conclusion, final appeal. So, and then I look at the footnote and it says verses 11 through 18, these are the remaining verses. There is a, it's all lumped together in their comments, uh, the, the footnote there. So there are the 11 through 18 is the, like the closing remarks here for Paul and the book. Uh, so as we go forward, keep that in mind. Let's go look at verse 11 in the KJV. It says, uh, Ye see how a how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. I'll read verse 12 also. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Well, they're, they're not related thoughts, 11 and 12, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm trying to get through them both. Uh, so whose turn is it next? Uh, I think it's me. Okay, verse 11 and 12, please. Uh, yeah, I think the reason Paul points out it's a large letter written by his own hand is, well, we know his eyesight was bad. And I think some letters written by Paul, he probably dictated to someone and they wrote them. And that's how some of these letters have been forged in his name. Remember, they got one letter and it said, as from a letter as by us so somebody has sent a letter pretending to be paul trying to get people to be circumcised and under the law of moses so he's saying i wrote this long letter in my own hand showing one his eyesight's bad they know it's hard on him so he must really care and that it's in his own handwriting so they can know it's legitimately from him that it's th what he puts in this letter is very important so um and the next thing uh, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. That's why I was saying, I think reaping to the flesh is in regards to the law and flesh, fleshly stuff. Um, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So no, they, they aren't willing to, to do what we do. We get attacked every day being called, uh, serpent seed telling people that they'll never die because of their sin uh telling people they'll have they'll live everlasting in their sin they twist everything they say they say we're, we're telling people they have a license to sin so we suffer the persecution of the cross of christ the real gospel offends the the, the religious it offends them and the message uh we're, we're assaulted for it we still are this day. So rather than that, these Judaizers, instead of being willing to say, nope, it's free gift. It's all based on Jesus. Moses's law is not put on the Gentiles. And knowing that they will suffer persecution for that fact, they would rather look good by compelling the Gentiles as really God's people, the religious people that really know so that the Jews can say, see, we have uh, uh, sovereignty over the Gentiles. We have power over them. We're leading them into the faith. And we're uh, making them get circumcised and preach the law of Moses. So it's almost like they can get puffed up in pride because they compelled the Gentiles to take on their religious traditions. Mm. rather than say, hey, our traditions are null and void. They don't save and the Gentiles don't need to do it because then they'd be persecuted, especially by the legalists and the Judaizers. That they're not willing to do. Amen. All right, Brother Cripps, let me read that in the uh, 11 and 12 in the Amplify. It says, 
see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand? Those who want to make a good impression in public before the Jews try to compel you to be circumcised just, to, just so they will escape being persecuted for faithfulness to the cross of Christ. Yeah, this is the point you just made, Brother Luke. You were asking if anybody understood it, and then the next verse, uh, you, you went ahead a little bit. <laughs> you made your point before we actually got to the verse. Uh, yeah, that I, the, Renee did, get, did a good job of explaining it. So the reason why, it's just explaining, Paul's explaining the reason why they do this. Um, yeah, it makes them look good, and they don't have to suffer any persecution. This is like, let's cover every base. Uh, and I believe that's what they, what they try to do uh, in terms of uh, uh, requiring the people be uh, circumcised and as we've gone over many many times uh that doesn't that doesn't save you uh, never has never will circumcision or anything that we do in the flesh doesn't save us it's a spiritual thing uh so they they did that to make themselves look good and they did a lot of things in, in that same uh in that same area because they're they're full of pride in my opinion and and they they want to uh, inflict their ideas and the way that uh, the, their thoughts and feelings onto other people, especially new believers, especially uh, babes, you know, to take advantage of them. And the, uh, that's what they've done. The, all of Paul's epistles are trying to undo uh, the work that they come in and do after Paul laid the foundation. I mean, this is, this is his whole ministry, unfortunately, is, uh, as we've said, coming back and and, and trying to make up for the, the lies that they tell. And I liked what uh, Renee said too about them them uh, writing letters saying they're from Paul. I mean, uh, there's plenty of evidence to to uh, to back that up as well. So he's got to come back and 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 write letters again and and visit uh, to to do damage control. Really. All right. Thank you. Uh, the. Uh... The footnote here for verse 11 in the NABRE says, large letters, in contrast to the finer hand of the scribe who wrote the letter up to this point, the larger Greek letters make Paul's message even more emphatic. Some find a hint of poor eyesight on Paul's part. So um, I think most people understand that Paul didn't write this letter and, and many, maybe many of the others uh, with his own hand, he had someone writing it for him and he would, he would speak it and they tra transcribe it. Uh, and, and uh, but then sometimes he would sign it or, or put something at the end. And in this case, he's letting him know that at least, at least I didn't write the whole thing, but I want to put this last part with my own hand. Um, and then uh, verse 12 through 15, the uh, footnote uh, on these, these next few verses, it says the Jewish Christian opponents wished not to be persecuted, possibly by Jews. But since Judaism seemed to have had a privileged status as a religion in the Roman Empire, circumcised Christians might, if taken as Jews, thereby avoid persecution from the Romans in any case. Paul instead stresses conformity with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, um, you know, maybe maybe they would uh, get along with the Romans better if they were, you know, circumcised. I've, I've never really heard of that before, but I do know this: that um, the Book of Hebrews is is about um, the Jewish believers who. Um, they're doing fine. They left Judaism. Uh, they're not uh, uh, following any of the tenets of, 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 uh, of Judaism. They're not doing their, going to the temple and doing animal sacrifices. But what happened was they get persecuted and even shunned and estranged from their own families who uh, uh, don't want to have anything to do with them because they're no longer doing the animal sacrifices. And so, therefore, because of this, they're under a lot of pressure. Uh, should I um, remain faithful to just the cross alone, or do I go and do the animal sacrifices so I'm no longer 
like like in Mormonism, how they'll and in Jehovah's Witnesses, how it's very common for them to shun someone in their family, and you're no longer in the family because of uh, you're you're not practicing Mormonism or or the Watchtower anymore. Uh, same thing was happening there. People were uh, being persecuted in that way, not by Rome, but by uh, the the Jews who were remain Jews and the Jewish believers who wanted to be at peace and, and get along so that they continue doing animal sacrifices. That's what, what Hebrews is telling them. You can't have it both ways. You either believe in Jesus or you're, you're still going to practice Judaism. But if you practice Judaism, uh, doing these animal sacrifices or anything, if you're putting faith in that, your faith is not in, entirely in Christ. So it's, it's no value. Um, all right. Let's any more before I go to the next verse. No, that's good. Okay. Uh, verse uh, 13 in the KJV says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Mm, yeah. 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 So uh, no one keeps the law. Uh, no, no one, no one's able to keep the law. Again, if we could keep the law, if that was the way that, that we are reconciled to God, then he would not have needed to send his son into the world to do what we could not do. Uh, on top of that, uh, Paul's making the point, not only uh, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in the flesh. So you conscribe someone else I think that's the right word, conscribe uh, someone else to be circumcised. And then you can say, hey, I'm the one that told them to be circumcised. So they're glorying in the flesh and, and certainly not in the spirit. So, so Paul's uh, warning against that here. You're muted, brother. Okay, thank you. you can't you read my lips by now? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I do. I do know some sign language, but unless you use sign language, I, I, I wouldn't be able to understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I know the sign language you that you want to use on me. No, <laughs> no, no, not you. Okay, uh, Sister Renee. Yeah, I love this part because it's basically saying all those people that demand you that you got to no, you got to keep the law to be saved. They themselves don't keep it. I, I keep telling people. All these people that come, but no, see, you got to keep the commandments of God. That's the, okay, you're not saved by that. But they they think they do it. They, they think they have met God's standard of perfection. But it says here that those, uh, they themselves who are circumcised, they don't keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh, like a crip said, so that they can go back to the Jews and say, see, I got the Gentiles to submit to our traditions instead of knowing that we're complete in Christ, that the Mosaic law was a shadow uh, fulfilled by Christ and that we're complete in him. No, they want to glory in their flesh. They want to take credit and now look with like religious leaders to draw disciples after themselves and you know, the Gentiles, they've submitted to the real truth people. I see that with the Hebrew roots thing right now. No matter what I do to show that we're complete in Christ, all this all this feast keeping and food laws they're trying to insist that we still got to do to please God. They don't understand. It's an insult to say we're not complete. We're lacking. And there's something in our flesh that helps us uh, be pleasing to God. And so that's all it is. And I, I, I summarize this. They that command you keep the law, they themselves don't keep it. It's all wrapped up in pride. All of it. Amen. Okay. Uh, let me look. Oops. Am I muted now? Nope. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's go back to this. Uh, let me see. All right, I don't think I need to comment on verse 13. Let's go to verse 14. Uh, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Okay, Sister Renee. Let's 
So Sorry. There yeah, I was typing something there. Okay. I, I love this. You know, I've been saying that quote from the old hymn, without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. But there is nothing to glory in except the cross of Christ. So, uh, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. See, a lot of people take these verses like, uh, those uh, they're, they're, have crucified the flesh and the lust thereof. Paul is saying this is a statement of fact. Our mindset set should be that we glory in the cross of Jesus. That alone is what gave us eternal life. And so because he was crucified and I'm in him, I was crucified. The world is crucified to me and I to it. I no longer live in it because I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That should be our attitude. And un unless you're saved, I don't think you can really get that. Yeah. I don't think you can understand that that is our true identity and that is what we believe. But the accusations of you love sin, you promote sin, they cannot see that when you really know that what, what Christ did for you, that you died with him, that the rest of this time, our walk is to reckon ourselves dead and alive in Christ. And that is how we should be thinking. And so we can't glory in anything we do. If we do glory, it should be only in the cross of Christ. Like Paul said, I come to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. And the summit of all of my messages and most of ours is Jesus Christ crucified and risen. It is the core of everything we preach. We, we, we keep him as our foundation for salvation and for our walk and our strength and our needs and our growth. It's all Jesus. It's all the cross. We cannot, you can tell somebody's testimony. You can tell a false gospel because what it glorifies. I felt so bad and then I repented of my sin and I put up the drinking and I stopped doing this and but they didn't stop their laziness and their apathy and their other flesh habits that they think they didn't go over and it's all about me 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 what I did how I changed how I'm good now how I used to be bad none of it is Christ crucified amen it's all him and that's all anybody should glory in mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Let's uh, read it in the uh, Amplified, Brother Cripps. It says, uh, verse 14, But far be it from me to boast in anything or anyone, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Wow, amen. Uh, Renee did a good job again. Uh, thanks for that, Renee. Absolutely. And uh, uh, you can hear, they have a tell. I always say this, people have a tell. If You can tell what they're relying on by their own testimony a lot of times. So if a person is saying, yeah, I gave this up, and I just like Renee said, I gave this up, and I gave the drinking up, and I did this and did that, and I I felt so bad, and I you know, repented of my sin, blah, blah, blah. Then it's about what they did. It's not about the cross of Christ. So Paul's making this very clear. Um, he's also said in the past he glories in his infirmities, but that's because it gives all glory to God. He, he's weak that uh, the spirit in him uh, is strong. Uh, so he's just making a finer point of that here uh, about not glorying in anything else except the cross of the Lord uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then making the point that the world is crucified unto him. He's just saying the world means nothing, as he said before. Uh, he's, we're crucified with Christ. Uh, the world doesn't uh, mean anything to us, only uh, what Christ did. And uh, that's it. All right. Thank you. Um, well, you know, you've heard me talk about the five solas of the Reformation, uh, one of them being sola gloria de Dios, means all, well, only glory for God. Uh, so man cannot have any glory um, uh, because the glory belongs 
all to God. Um, and the only way that God really gets all the glory uh, uh, is as if that it, it's uh, not based on personal merit, not based on uh, we deserve it. We're totally undeserving, but God is gracious. Sola gracia. Only because God is being gracious and, and giving us a free gift of eternal life that's totally unearned or deserved by us, uh, that way God still gets all the glory. We don't get any. But there are people that unfortunately take that one step too far and um, in order for they think that in order for god to keep all the glory man has nothing to do with it that's what they do in calvinism calvinism teaches that uh, god imposes this uh, on a person unbeknownst to them god will the holy spirit of god comes into a person brings their spirit to life, they're born again, they haven't even believed, and now they're able to believe because they have a living spirit, so now they can when they, they can become a believer. Uh, and, that, and that way, uh, they, uh, they, God gets all the glory because God imposes it on them. They had nothing to do with it. That's uh, what they call monergism. It's only, only God, uh, but... Um, I like a, there's one pastor I listen to. Um, uh, it's Grace Faith 08 is the name of the channel. Grace Faith 08. And the slogan on the church is uh, Grace Faith. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Uh, God, God is gracious enough to offer us eternal life as a free gift. Our part is to believe. And But uh, people think that if we believe, and uh, it's not God imposing it on us, that somehow we get some of the glory because we believed. But um, it's uh, if you look at it as, as a transaction with a gift, um, if, if I give you a fantastic gift, uh, do you get any glory because you accepted a gift? No, I, I, all the glory is still for me. I'm the one that created the gift, made the gift, paid for the gift, bought it, wrapped it, gave it to you. All you did was get it. Yes. No, and there's no loss of my glory for me uh, just because you've accepted the gift. So uh, that's where this glory is. Uh, God still gets all the glory, even though uh, it's man's job to accept the gift and trust trust the Lord for salvation. It's God's job to offer it and provide it for everybody. Amen, brother. Right. Okay. I liked your amen there. Very enthusiastic, brother. Thank well, you. an enthusiastic point. What are we glorying in? Is it a gift from God or do we develop it ourselves? Is it, is it because of who we are and what we do? Absolutely not. It is a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the KJV verse uh, 15. No. Yeah, 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Wow. Yeah. So as, as believers, we all know that God makes us a new creation. Uh, he uh, quickens our dead spirit, makes us alive in him. And the Holy spirit resides with us and makes us a new creature. And of course, when we get our eternal bodies, then we'll no longer struggle with the flesh as we've talked about many times. So he's saying that anything, he could have said anything that we do in the flesh does not amount to anything. It's about being a new creature. And how do we become a new creature? What God does in us. He does that work for us. It's not anything that we develop in, our, in, in and of ourselves. Therefore, circumcision or uncircumcision availeth nothing. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear. I'm sure someone would find a way to twist it, but th this one seems almost untwistable. We'll see what Renee has to say. <laughs> All right, thank you, Renee. Yeah, they'll find a way. Uh, don't lose hope, Chris. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't lose hope. It sure won't. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter your flesh. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew who is circumcised in the flesh or a Gentile who is not, but a new creature, because. This kingdom is spiritual. It is not gotten through physical means. And so physical things have nothing to do with your birth or your relationship with God. So it doesn't matter uh, if you're 
physically circumcised or not. It's a new creature. Paul says elsewhere, it's circumcision of the heart. This circumcision was an act done in the flesh. And it says Abraham did it because he was already saved, by the way. The circumcision didn't save Abraham. He said, did he do it? What was he? Was he justified while in circumcision or uncircumcision? It says in uncircumcision. So even Abraham's work did not save him. Right. Believe God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So these people coming in and saying you must be circumcised size and keep the law of Moses. Uh, they're wrong there. It does not avail anything. It has nothing at all to do with you being reconciled to God but a new creature. So it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, if you're a whole new creature, neither Jew nor Greek, but a child of the living God. And that is a spiritual birth and has nothing to do with the flesh. Amen. Thank you. Oh, by the way, that's why arguing over genealogy, who's the real Jew and who isn't, doesn't matter. Don't argue genealogies these things of the flesh don't matter we're children of god by faith period uh, let me ask since uh, we normally are quitting about this time we have a few more verses and then we have to allow some time to give our conclusions uh summaries um is it gonna are we gonna go too late for anybody here in the panel is that can you hang in here longer to get this done or should we uh, yeah I, I can uh, right. if, if you're asking me, I can. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right, then. All right. Um, all right. Verse, um, let me see. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So I don't really need to elaborate on that. You covered it very well. Verse 16 says, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Okay, whose turn is it? Right. Right. Yep. right. Hold on here. Yeah, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon him, and mercy upon the Israel of God. That is actually uh, Israel of God here he's talking about is a spiritual type of Israel. No Jew or Gentile, and it's not based on genealogy at all. And so if you're walking according to this rule, that we're not divided by flesh, by nations, by genealogy, uh, male or female, rich or poor, then peace be upon you. Bless you. Because you understand that this is a spiritual kingdom and God's true Israel is anyone that trusts in Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. All right, Brother Cripps, let me uh, look at it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 16 in the Amplified says, um, Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule, that is, who discipline themselves and conduct their lives by this principle, and upon the true Israel of God. Jewish believers is what they say. Hmm. Um, gosh, I'm not, I'm not sure I can add anything to that. Uh, as many walk as according to this rule, peace be on them. So, uh, the above verses for in Christ, neither circumcision availed nothing, uh, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So I can only, I can only respond to it thinking that, that that's what Paul is saying, that, uh, those that understand that it's all Christ, and the above verse, the, the, the to not glory in anything other than the cross of Christ. So uh, if you walk according to to that, then there will be peace on them. Uh, I, I, I think, obviously, we're uh, part of that now, even though uh, could have been talking about Israel back then. We're part of that, I believe. So it would be on anyone that understands the, the concept uh, of... Um, of that it's all uh, the cross of Christ and it's all uh, Christ Jesus. Nothing else matters except for him making us a new creation, new creature. Amen. Thank you. Well said. So this rule, it says, uh, according to this rule, that goes back to the previous verses and it's talking about the cross and the new creature. So that's the rule. That's the principle that we, uh, we 
uh, rely upon. And um, the Israel of God, though, um, this in the Amplified says there that's the Jewish believers. But uh, I think the Israel of God that in, in, in Romans we learn that uh, that's all, all believers, Jew right. or Gentile, because Gentiles were grafted in, so there's no distinction Jew or Gentile. Right. But replacement theology is wrong. Yeah. No, we are one new man in Christ. There is no like Israel uh, that's God's people plus the Israel of God, which is Jew and Gentile. No, one new man. There's only one group of God's people, and it's those that trust in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Amen. That is God's people. And here it's called Israel of God, and that includes believing Israelites. Mm -hmm. The only difference is now God's Israel includes the Gentiles. That's why it says, I will make a people that are no people, meaning they're, they're not a nation. They're from all nations, and I'm bringing them together with the believing remnant of the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's one new man in Christ. Uh, God only has one group of people now, those that believe in Jesus and those that don't. And that includes the believing Jews. That's why the foundation of the church was Jews or Hebrews. And then the Gentiles are grafted in. Remember, it talks about the branch being grafted in. And now it's neither Jew nor Greek, but the Israel of God is both believing Jews and believing Gentiles, one new man in Christ. That's why I think these modern churches got it wrong when they're talking about Israel, God's people in the sense of genealogy. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that it does say that God wants to bring uh, all of the descendants, the physical descendants into faith. And it looks like he'll be working on them in the last days. But God's people are believers in Jesus. That's the group that belongs to God right now. Amen. And it is Jew and Gentile. The only difference is Israel, many of them didn't believe, so they're out. And right. the ones that did believe have now been joined by believing Gentiles. And that's God's nation. Amen. Okay, then. Let's uh, look at the last two verses in the KJV. I'll read them together. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've talked about all the people that uh, trouble uh, Paul, um, saying he's not an apostle, coming in and and uh, trying to get the circumcision or get, get them to go back under the law, all the stuff that they do. And then uh, he's got to uh, come back, as I said earlier, and, uh, and, and make sure everybody's on the same page, you know, uh, not... Uh, 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 be afraid that they're they're not in the faith anymore, or that they are um, uh, being led away. Uh, but this uh, specifically, I believe, is the, them saying he's not an apostle. Um, that's all I can draw from. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's saying that he is an apostle. He's saved. He has the the Lord Jesus uh, with him and in him, and he's of his. Uh, so he's saying, "Don't trouble me anymore about that." Uh, I think he's made it clear enough in his epistles uh, that he does have the authority. Uh, and then the last one is just a finishing statement, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in your spirit. Amen. Um, I, I, I don't think I can add anything to that. That's pretty self-explanatory. So I'll let Renee go. All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, Sister Renee. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm grabbing the cat. Hold on. Something got knocked down. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Hold on, let me move it. Okay. So many animals here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in the, my body the marks. And he's literally talking about his scars. Um, he has suffered greatly for this gospel message, and he will not allow anyone to corrupt it. No Judaizers, no legalists, nothing. Because he has suffered 
literally he's been put in prison he's been beaten and he says when he ba uh, bear the marks that he's talking about the scourgings he had on his back did we go to the very last we did the last right brethren the grace of our lord jesus christ be with your spirit yes we did yeah, right okay yeah and that's just the salutation here um but i think what he's saying here is nobody should challenge his authority on what he says in this letter he wrote it with his own hands and he bears the marks of the persecution for the simplicity of this message right. uh, the, the israel of god thing it really bothers me because extreme dispensationalists still make it confusing like god has two sets of people god has one set of people believers that's it. And the foundation of that people, the God, Israel of God, was actual descendants of Israel, believing ones. And then Gentiles from all over the world grafted in. And now Israel of God is it's not replacement theology. It's it's one new man. It's God's people now. And if the descendants of Israel that are in unbelief, because it tells us they were broken off because of unbelief. Doesn't it say that? If they are broken off because of unbelief, they're not part of that God's people right now, but they can be grafted back in. That's what Hebrews talks about, doesn't it? Or the Romans that said uh, they're broken off because of unbelief. You know, my hope for Israel is that they might be saved. And then uh, the Gentiles don't boast against the branches and all of that. So I think that there is a false teaching that God has two groups of people. He has one group of people and that's it. It's not based on genealogy. And I don't think that's replacement. Theology. Amen. Right. All right. I uh, can't remember where we are now. The last two verses, uh, is it uh, Crips or Renee's turn? We both gone. We both gone. Okay, yeah. good. Let me, uh, let me, Crips. Uh, I commend you uh, on verse seventeen. Um, you connected that uh, as Paul did. I'm, I'm actually blown away by this because I know that uh, in the uh, conclusion I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start off with talking about verse one, Galatians chapter one, verse one, and uh, then chapter 6 verse 17 that the very first verse and the very last verse apart from his uh uh salutation are are the this the same point so he starts off in the, the very beginning and the very end making that very same point and you were correct the way you uh ex explained it that uh uh it, it's a challenge to his apostleship he's sick and tired of 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 uh, these uh, Judaizers, these false teachers, following him, being a thorn in his flesh, uh, uh, telling everybody that Paul's a false apostle, and that's what the reference to is in the, in the verse is that he's uh, uh, henceforth let no man trouble me. Don't talk to me about that anymore. I'm fed up with listening to to, to that. Don't, I don't want to hear any more about it. Amen. Praise God. Praise God for that. Uh -huh. So um, now it's time uh, for us to give our uh, summary. I, I, I think it's better if we can just tie in the tonight's summary along with the entire book. So um, uh, who would like to go first uh, to give us your, uh, your thoughts on the entire study of the book? If um, you're, go ahead. I, I can go and I'll, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, to me, this was a, a, a great um, chapter uh, or, or a great book, actually. Uh, there were a lot of things in there I can take away from it. Um, I think uh, Paul does a great job. Again, I mean, he's doing this all the time, but again, he's refuting this idea that uh, our, our works, the circumcision or anything like that, and going back under the law is pointless. And he's um, trying to get the church to remember that they are Christ's and they're they're bought by him or they're his purchase and that uh, we uh, they're saved by what Christ did alone, not by anything that they do. I think that point was made very clear, um, particularly in this chapter. Uh, there's there's a lot here um, uh, about how we're supposed to. So in, in Galatians, I think there's a lot about how we're supposed to treat other believers. 
Um, I think there's many points that he's made about we should, uh, in this one, at least this last chapter, bearing uh, one another's burdens, uh, uh, we should uh, not not think of ourselves higher than than we ought. Uh, you know, stay away from pride, things like that. Um, yeah, it was a good study. I'll just, like I said, I'll keep it brief, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, there's a lot here to, to take away, and I'm looking forward to uh, moving to the next one. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sister Renee, give us a synopsis, a uh, conclusion on the book of Galatians. Yeah. Well, Galatians is awesome. I always remember, oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? You should not obey the truth. Every time Paul comes against a false prophet, is that false prophet promoting sin? No. Legalism. They always come in, but you got to keep the food laws. You got to keep the feast. You got to keep uh, 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 circumcision, anything that man can glory in. That's the false teaching. Why? Because and it's the same thing we, we're concerned with, because it takes away from the glory of the cross of Christ. It makes it of none effect because now you're relying on something you're doing instead of what was done. And Paul's letter to the Galatians is so awesome. He doesn't allow any wiggle room for self-righteousness here. And it's one of the greatest books for defending the gospel uh, in its simplicity. And uh, isn't this the one that puts a double curse on anyone who preaches another gospel? Isn't this the same book? If any man or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. It's, uh, it's hardcore. And uh, I didn't realize that this was the chapter that said the Israel of God. I'm glad we got to that because there's a lot of confusion on who we are it, like there's God's got two groups of people. He's got one and the Gentiles were grafted into them. And those that didn't believe were broken off. That's it. It's the same group of people, but there was a remnant that believed and the rest didn't. And that remnant was joined by believers all over the world. And that's, that's the body of Christ. There is uh, there's no separation there. So uh, I love Galatians. I think there's uh, warnings, where he's, you know, it's a stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. It also tells us use not that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. So we are free. Don't use that freedom, though, to serve your flesh. Use it to serve God. Amen. And as Cripps often says, it's our reasonable service. It really is. After what God has done for us. And I think everything should come forth from that assurance, from the heart of full assurance of faith, knowing that he redeemed us. Because how can you serve God with joy and peace and gratitude if you're not really sure if he saved you or not? I mean, everything has to come from that. And Paul is constantly bringing them back to the truth of uh, the gospel and what Christ has done. I just love this book and use it a lot. Amen. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think we started off by uh, uh, stating that, uh, at least I, I remember Renee and I, I can't remember if you, uh, I think you probably agreed, Cripps, that uh, Galatians is in our top three books of the Bible. For, uh, John, the Gospel of John, Galatians, and Hebrews are the, what I think are the three most important books. Um, so why is Galatians that important? Uh, I, if you haven't listened to the entire study on Galatians, you know, the whole thing is available on the church channel. So I, I urge everybody to go and watch it and listen to it very carefully, take notes and consider it. But I, I think that certain things were certainly uh, established uh, beyond any, any question. And yeah, there's a there's a there's a handful of verses that I think are the prominent verses that I think that uh, stood out to me. I mentioned that in uh, the last verse of the book um, relates right back to the first verse. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, 
and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he, he starts off right, in the, on the, right off the bat saying, I am an apostle, and, and Jesus himself made me an apostle. Not No man declared me an apostle. So the first point he's making here is to address this issue, that he's being uh, uh, challenged. His apostleship is being challenged. Um, and then when we look at 7 and 8, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So here now we see there's a second problem. Not only uh, are they saying Paul's a false apostle, but they're saying his gospel is a false gospel. And they're saying that you've got to also practice Judaism. So Paul says, I marvel because he's shocked. He's blown away that they could be persuaded to go in to believe this false gospel message after he taught them the truth. And then he says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. The troubles are, that's the people, the false teachers, the Judaizers, the men from Judea, the men from Jerusalem, certain men from James. These people are the ones he's talking about who are bringing uh, Judaism into Christianity, saying you've got to practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. And it says they would pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, then he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I forgot the, the word that Ben used rather, in, rather than accursed. Maybe you can tell us, Ben, but um, so Paul says, if, if Paul himself or any of his co-workers or even an angel shows up preaching another gospel, it's a false gospel, and uh, you, it, it's a, a curse on them. Um, and then uh, verse 13, it says, uh, I noticed it, 13 and 14, he's, he makes this distinction. I think this is important to understand. He says, for ye have heard of my con conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. Huh. And in 14, he says, and profited in the Jews' religion. Mm -hmm. So Paul is, uh, this is quite uh, provocative. He's referring to it as the Jews' religion. So what he's done is he is separating himself completely, not identifying with the Jews' religion in any way for himself. Amen. And that's, that's an important thing to get, that Paul says it's the Jews' religion that doesn't have any part in Christianity. Uh, and then we got this, uh, and that because uh, of false brethren, unawares brought in, and that can happen in any congregation, false believers, false teachers brought in unaware. You don't realize it. That's like the, the, the sheep, I mean, the wheat and the tares. This is sitting right next to you in the pew, except they're a tear. They're pretending to be a, a real believer, or else they... I uh, think they're a real believer, but they don't even understand the actual gospel. Mm -hmm. So these are false brethren. People are unaware that they're there with you, but they're there privily to spy out our liberty, the freedom in the gospel, that we're not under the bondage of the law. And it says, um, spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. The law is bondage. The gospel is liberty. But when Peter would come to Antioch, I was stood him face to face. So here we, we, Paul's talking about this confrontation with Peter. This is a very important event in the Bible because Peter was, um, he was willing to uh, uh, be a hypocrite. Uh, he, he was no longer following uh, Judaism. He was no longer following the dietary laws. He had an angel appear to him and, and t tell him uh, that, uh, Wait a second. It was an angel. It was a vision, and God God told him that hey, the dietary laws are no longer in effect. Their things unclean, including the Gentiles themselves. They're not unclean. So Peter should know better than anybody else that you you can associate with Gentiles. You can eat non kosher food, and and that's what he did until the men from it says in verse twelve before before that certain came from James. Some men came from James, which means the Jerusalem church. Now, I don't know if James himself sent them, 
Uh, James claimed later that he, he never sent people with, to do any such thing, but apparently they're men from James because they're part of that congregation. And that's probably what was being taught in the congregation is that, yeah, don't quit the law. You've got to keep practicing the law. Uh, so certain men from James and he did eat with the Gentiles. So here, this is account of this uh, time where Paul stood up to, to Peter. And then chapter three, we got, oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Who can ever forget that line? So they were bewitched. The Galatians were bewitched. These false teachers bewitched them. And Paul was marveled at it. This is, he says, this only would I learn of you. You received ye, the, received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So here's the first indication now. Uh, verse two in chapter three that we know that the people that Paul is talking to are born again believers. These are not false converts. These are not, uh, they're, they're people who are believed because he says, you received ye the spirit. They have the spirit, the Holy Spirit. You know, if you have the spirit, you are a believer. Uh, and then in verse 10, he says, for as many as are the works of law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth, not in all things which were written in the book of the law. So uh, now you have the issue of, uh, if you're gonna be under the law, if you're gonna believe these false teachers and think you gotta practice the law, you're actually putting yourself under a curse because you'll have to follow it perfectly. If you're not able to follow it perfectly, uh, you should realize the, the folly of that. It's got to be faith alone in Christ alone. Now. Verse 15, 26, and, and 4, verse 6, these all are indications to me, again, that he's talking to believers because he calls them brethren. Now, there's only the word brethren in the Bible is only used in, in two ways. It's either a Jew talking to a fellow Jew, there are brethren in that respect, or if you use brethren uh, apart from that, it's talking to someone who is a brother or sister in Christ, a believer. So Paul says brethren. He refers to them as brethren, not only here, but numerous times throughout this book of Galatians. And then he says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So he calls them brethren. He says they're the children of God. No one is a child of God unless they're born again believer. And because ye are sons, he says, ye are sons. God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts. How could anybody dispute these are born again believers that Paul is talking to who, who were bewitched and led astray into thinking that they got to get circumcised and practice Judaism too. Um, and then it says the law is our schoolmaster. So we learn the purpose of the law is to uh, teach us our need for Christ, but we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Um, and then the verse, a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. Well, that's, important for us to keep in mind today. If you let a little leaven into the congregation, it will spread. This is why if a false teacher is in the congregation, or even not if we're not talking about doctrine, but if we just have someone in the congregation that's sowing discord, uh, is trying to uh, cause division to things, that's also a type of leaven that is going to spread and cause a, a big problem in the church. So a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. No, we, we got to prevent the leaven from getting in at all. And then uh, finally, uh, works of the flesh versus works of the spirit uh, in the very end here that telling us to walk by the spirit, uh, not by the flesh. Um, so I think though, I just wanted to cover some of the main points and main verses that really stood out to me as really significant in this book of Galatians. Yeah. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump is important in the sense of the gospel, too, because any little addition makes Christ of no effect because it, it means you don't understand it. If you think there's one little thing that you got to do, you're not trusting in what Jesus already did. And that's sadly what most Christians truly believe, that they're getting to heaven because Jesus died for them plus they're being faithful and good and obedient and it's not it's their righteousness has nothing to do 
with the righteousness of God, which is imputed on us when we trust in Christ. So they're confusing positional standing with fellowship, sonship with fellowship, discipleship with salvation. They're making a muddy mess of it. So 11 inserted in the gospel, 11 is a whole lump. It confuses everything. It makes it makes the gospel not effective anymore. The reason the gospel is God's power unto salvation is because a person comes to the understanding that Christ has redeemed him from the curse of the law, that they have been reconciled to God. They have peace with God through what Jesus did. He paid for all their sins because he died once for all, sanctified by his blood, permanently perfected forever. And that's why they have eternal life because the blood cleansed them. And because they believed that, God counted it to them for righteousness. So then that's salvation done. So a little leaven in that salvation message completely destroys the power of God into salvation. Because you're not you're confused. You're thinking salvation is based on something you're doing. And it cannot be divided. If it be of grace, no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So it's really important that the gospel be clear and simple. And that salvation is based only on the work of Christ. Everything else in scripture is either pointing to Christ and what he did as shadows and stories. The rest of it is encouraging God's people on how they should behave. And people mix that up. So leaven can destroy everything. Amen. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Brother Cripps, any more uh, before we say good night? I know, sir. That's good. Okay, Brother Ben, uh, now let me ask you to get the last word. Uh, you've been listening. Uh, what would you say about this uh, study of the book of Galatians? Well, uh, I guess it might be a good time to, again, summarize one of the things I thought the, the Lord showed me about the Galatians book. And, and uh, I believe it's a, it's a pretty strong parallel to Joshua 6, 7, and 8, where, uh, again, they're, at, they're about, Joshua was uh, about to, take, they're about to uh, conquer the land. And but the Lord said certain things are going to be off limits to you, and um, that word for off, another word for off limits is the word anathema in Galatians. It basically, means you know something gets it's not part of the covenant under and off limits. Basically, means it's not part of the covenant of of, of that you're under. So um, and you see a lot of parallels. So for example, in Joshua, they saw something that was off limits. That's the law of Galatians. Uh, Josh, uh, God said if. If you partake of the thing that's off limits, it's going to trouble you. And we see that word troubled uh, in Galatians where it talks about there, there are some that trouble you. And then the troubling, will, will it, it actually made them weak. So uh, they they sought the Babylonian armor, Achan did. And when he uh, uh, partook of that armor, uh, they immediately started losing in battle. And God said, until you get rid of that, uh, the, the anathema, or in, in the Old Testament it was called kerem, um, unless you get rid of that uh, anathema, um, I'm no longer going to be with you. Um, and so they started losing in battle. That's exactly what happened. And that's exactly what happened to the Galatians. Once they started partaking of the law, even though they started in the spirit, if you don't have the spirit of God, you're not his. So if you have the spirit of God, you're a saved believer. And so they were having spiritual success. They were running, as Paul calls it. But someone cut in on them with false doctrine uh, and tried to introduce the law. It made them weak. Paul called them that... These people are all they have to offer you are weak and beggarly things. And that's exactly what happened in, in Joshua. They, they started losing in battle. And God said, I'm no longer going to be with you. And again, didn't mean I was going to leave you forever. It just meant that my power, I'm not I'm not going to be with you in, in battle. And as soon as they um, so, again, the, the Galatians, they 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 went to they believed another gospel. Uh, and by uh, most theologians and most people, I think, uh, would agree that. Uh, another gospel, uh, if you started off with the right gospel, then you accepted a, a false gospel. That's a form of apostasy. Um, and so, but Paul, Paul corrected them, said, no, this, these are weak and regularly things. Make changes. Uh, he, it, it, Paul makes a strong case again and says, no, uh, he makes allegory of the law versus grace, the allegory of the bond woman and the free woman. Uh, he, he basically lays out the case between the law and grace that they can't mix it all. And he calls them sons of God. He says that you're, you're, you're sons of God. He doesn't question their salvation or initial faith or say that they're, they're unsafe because they apostatize. 
but he corrected them and they're back on course and God will be with them again if they make those corrections by rejecting the law, marking and aborting those who are, are those Judaizers. And that's exactly what happened to Joshua. Got, once he took care of that problem, the, that, that karem or anathema, God was with them again and they started having spiritual success. And I think that's a direct parallel. And I love the book of Galatians because that makes that case, uh, I think, very clear, not only in, in the New Testament, but uh, using, uh, alluding to uh, Old Testament um, examples. All right, thank you. Well, Galatians is, is a fairly short book, uh, only six chapters, but it's very important and very profound. Um, all right, uh, if there's nothing else from anybody, uh, let me see, this is Wednesday. Uh, Sister Renee, do you have a program tomorrow night? Yeah, uh, yeah, Eberly, Wretched Knucklehead, he's going to be discussing the Church of Christ. Uh, he believes it's a cult. And others like them and their religious errors. So we're going to be discussing that with him tomorrow night on Thursday's Theological Throwdown. I also wanted to answer a question for a couple of the viewers. Now, off the top of my head, I can't be certain, but being blotted out of the Book of Life is different than the Lamb's Book of Life. Like, I believe the Lamb's Book of Life is the Book of Eternal Life. And the only way somebody's blotted out of that is since Jesus died for the whole world, that if they die in unbelief, rejecting Jesus, then their name's blotted out. I believe because he died for the whole world, that anyone that rejects him has their name blotted out because everybody's name's there. And that's how I tell people sometimes, you're going to let your name be blotted out because you reject this. I believe when they receive it, it's like writing it in blood. It's there forever. But if you reject him, you're blotted out. But when Moses said, blot my name out of the book of life uh, for Israel's sake, I think the book of life is the same as the book of the living. It just means the book of those who are alive. So to blot the name out of the book of life means to take their life, to die physically. And I believe that Moses was just saying, hey, blot my name out of the book of life for Israel's sake. Take my life and spare Israel. I think that's what's going on here. I have to do a study. I will do a full study of it, of course, in case I'm wrong. But I believe that the Lamb's Book of Life and the Book of Life are two different things. I think the Book of Life is just a metaphor for the Book of the Living or those that are physically alive. And to blot their name out is to mean die, for them to die. Sorry, it was, there was a lot of confusion about it. So I wanted to answer her before I forgot. Do y'all have anything on that? No, uh, just... Um, uh, uh, I, I just asked you to talk about the, your program tomorrow night. So uh, is, have you said everything you need to say about that? Yeah, Everly's going to be there. We're going to talk about the Church of Christ. All right. Okay. Um, I guess we've all given our, our summaries. So uh, all that's left to say is that I want to thank everybody in the congregation for being here tonight. Uh, we... So join Sister Renee tomorrow night and then Friday night. Don't forget to join us again on this same channel for the Fun Fellowship Friday night. And that is 930 Eastern time. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.